Hello and welcome to the end of the world. <laughs> Peter Zion presents the Middle Ohio Valley at the end of the world. Uh, I'm Greg Delamister, Professor of Economics at Maryland College, also the Vice President of Programs for the Economic Roundtable. Peter's visit to the Middle Ohio Valley is co-sponsored by First Settlement Orthopedics, the Economic Roundtable of the Ohio Valley, and Marietta College. I particularly want to thank Dr. Greg, Greg Krivchenia, Todd Burge, and Dr. Josh Jacobs for helping to arrange and coordinate Peter's <coughs> visit. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the Economic Roundtable has been around a while. We help bring speakers like Peter to the Middle Ohio Valley. Uh, we have membership in Parkersburg and Marietta in the surrounding area. Uh, we're a wide open organization. Uh, membership uh, opportunities are available. Uh, our next speaker is on April 16th. We have Stephanie Stuckey, who's the CEO of Stuckey's Inc. Uh, if you travel in the southern part of the states, you'll probably know what Stuckey's is all about. Uh, and She's going to tell her story about how she reclaimed the family business uh, on April 16th at the Parkersburg Country Club. So if you're interested, you can check us out at economicroundtable.org for more information on our speakers. We're pleased to see such a diverse group here tonight. We've got students, we've got uh, business folks, we've got retired gadflies, and I'm looking at you, Bob Chase. <laughs> We've got all sorts here, so it's great to see uh, a, a wide variety here. Um, our speaker, Peter Zion, brings a wealth of knowledge from his extensive career in geopolitics. Peter has a unique ability to make complex global trends understandable and relevant to audiences from all walks. His experiences range from serving with the U.S. State Department in Australia to developing analytical models for Stratfor uh, and eventually founding his own firm, Zion uh, Geopolitics. Peter's the author, as you can see up here, of several influential books, including The Accidental Superpower and his latest, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. His work offers insightful analyses on demography, economics, and global politics, providing valuable perspectives on how these forces shape our future. And as some of you, some of you may know, Peter has a respectable presence on YouTube, where he's a frequent poster of these short videos. Often you see about uh, trips and around on hikes and in nature preserves. Uh, well, he's no Mr. Beast, and he's got <laughs> quite a few followers and subscribers there. College students know who Mr. Least is. Uh, we're very pleased that Peter has taken the time to hike in our neck of the woods. Please welcome Peter Zach. Hello, everybody. Uh, no judgment. Who until like two weeks ago had no idea who I was? Okay. Uh, just so you guys know, no one brings me in so that they can feel comfortable. <laughs> Solid! <laughs> this is the most important dude to live in the last 500 years. He was critical not for what he did or who he was, but who he scared. Us. We were so terrified of having to fight down the Red Armies on the plains of Europe that we changed the way the world worked because we knew we needed allies, not to stand shoulder to shoulder with us, but in front of us to suck up ammo. And since the Europeans had just been through the most disastrous war in human history, we knew that the bribe had to be robust. So we sent our navies out to patrol the global ocean so that anyone can go anywhere at any time and interface with any partner and access any market and any commodity if, in exchange, you would be a bullet shield. <laughs> we know that today is globalization and free trade. There's just one problem with the plan. I mean, it generated the fastest economic growth we've ever had. Made the world a better place, allowed us to triple our population, take technology in fundamentally new directions, but how flaw. We won. When the wall fell down, we didn't have a plan for what was next. Now, the president at the time was George Herbert Walker Bush. His idea, his crazy 
crazy ideas. What if we take this alliance, the greatest alliance in human history, and play it forward? What if we change the conditions of globalization? So instead of being a meat shield for us, you have to adopt certain things on human rights, on say fair capitalism. What if we use this opportunity in history to remake the human condition? And what do you say to have a conversation about that as a nation? And if you look at who he was and what he had done, he had served in Congress, he had been ambassador to China, he had been in the business community, he had been in the White House, he ran the CIA, he knew everyone by their first name who mattered in the world. He was the right person at the right time, in the right place. And so, of course, we voted in that box. <laughs> And we started down a series of ever more populist, nationalistic, and narcissistic political uh, contests that elected a succession of ever more economically nationalist leaders. And that includes the transition <coughs> from, to Biden. From an economic, international point of view, the biggest difference between the last two and, I guess, the current two now or that Trump would tweet out what his policy was, whereas Biden goes through the tweets, scrubs them with a the grammar checker, and actually embeds them into the federal bureaucracy so that they outlast. We are having, we're having a political contest between the same two flavors of economic nationalism again. Now, this changes a lot. The rise of globalization, now it's fall, the Americans withdrawal from the system, but I think the best way to understand how it really shapes today's economic environment is to talk about the mechanics of how Stalin changed the way we live. This is a standard demographic profile. This is the Koreans at the dawn of the globalized era. We're going to see a bunch of these today. At the bottom, the whitest, that's the children. As you go up, mortality narrows it down to get young adults, mature adults, retirees at the very top, men on one side, women on the other. This is what a normal system looks like. And this has a very specific economic model that pairs with it. Because when the flare in your population structure is below roughly age 40, it's all about the consumption. You're raising kids, you're building your house, you're going to college, it's all built on the spending. But you're very new at your job. You don't have a lot of skills built up. So your productivity is low. Your consumption is high. Productivity low, that means inflation tends to be a little bit out of control. Now, the next bracket up, roughly 40 to 65, these are people where the kids have left the house, where the house has been paid down, and you now have literally decades of work experience. So your incomes are high, but your kids are gone, there's nothing to spend it on. So you become very cash positive, and you use that money to prepare for your future, to prepare for retirement. So this is where the capital base is. This is where the tax base is. And then when you retire, you liquidate, you cash out, you go into T-bills and non-dangerous investments because you never know if there's going to be a currency crash or a market crash. And in a system like this, all the real activity is down at the bottom. Consumption, debt, inflation. The tax base is low, so there's not a lot of technology. There's not a lot of education. This is how we were until Stalin. And in our reaction to Stalin with globalization, all of a sudden people were able to interact with anyone at the world, across the world at the same time. Everyone was suddenly able. And as the world opened up with opportunities, people started taking manufacturing and services jobs. And all of those are in town. This is an agricultural demographic. Kids are free labor. You have as many of them as you can put up with, plus one. Because that's how you find out it's too many. <laughs> But when you move into town, kids are no longer free labor, they're an expense. And adults aren't stupid. You have fewer of them. And 75 years later, here's the Koreans now. Radically different economic model. All of that consumption that was at the base of the pyramid, that's gone. There aren't enough young people even to theoretically repopulate anymore. And that bulge from 40 to 65, that's now the story. So you've got people saving for retirement in mass, providing scads of capital for both the private sector and the public sector. So investment is huge. Technological advancement is huge. Infrastructure is great. Mid-tier retraining is the norm. The Koreans have led the way. 
And in the next 10 years, they're going to lead us to what's after this, because this bulge now moves into mass retirement. And the Koreans will have to figure out an economic and social model that is not based on consumption or production or investment. What will that look like? <clears throat> I don't have a clue. This has never happened before in human history. But what I do know is that they won't be alone because we have all been shaped by the same trends and we are all going down this path. Different starting points, different speeds, but we're all part of the same story. Here's us. We're a little atypical, not just compared to the Koreans, but compared to everyone else. Two big reasons. Number one, the United States has a lot of elbow room. So we didn't go farm to city. We went farm to suburbs, I'm sorry, farms to small towns to suburbs to city. And those two extra steps in the middle bought a lot of time and meant that the degradation in our birth rate had been much more slow than it has been almost everywhere else. Second, globalization was a bribe. If we had to put our global economy, or our economy out in the global commons, that's a, just another word for an empire. And so we didn't. The whole idea was to pay people to be on our side. We kept our economy at home. We allowed everyone else to come here and access it, but we didn't dominate the global system. And so we didn't industrialize nearly as quickly. And that's helping us now. Now, there are a couple problems here. Let's start with the generation that I'm very happy to say no longer matters at all. The boomers. Oh my God, feel so good to say that. <laughs> Largest generation we have ever had. And as of the fourth quarter of calendar year 2022, half of them have already moved into retirement. They've, this retirement has two big impacts. Number one, finance. They've already liquidated their savings. Half of the entire generation has already liquidated, a little bit more. Which means we've seen capital costs rising from record lows to something much closer to normal. In the last four, four and a half years, capital costs in this country have increased by a factor of three. It's not the Fed. It's not Biden. It's not Trump. It's the boomers leaving and rolling one final grenade in through the door. Second, labor. Boomers, largest generation ever. That's another way of saying largest workforce ever. And half of them have already retired. Most of the inflation that we're going to be experiencing over the next several years is going to be based on a shortage in the labor market, and it will not be fixed anytime soon. In fact, for these two issues, finance and labor, we have to wait quite some time. On the finance scale, we have to wait for the next large generation to enter their mid-50s, with the point where they become capital rich. That will be the millennials. That's 12 years off. In the labor situation, we have to wait for another large generation to be born, to grow up, to get trained, and enter the workforce. That will be the millennials' kids. And they won't enter the labor force in large number until 2045. Hire, borrow. If you take nothing else from this presentation, take those two words. Hire, borrow. Because this is the cheapest the labor market will be for 20 years and the cheapest capital access will be for over 10. Now there is one other aspect here that involves the millennials, of course. They will save us. They will provide the labor and the capital that we need in the long term. And in the meantime, the oldest millennials this year turn 45. The new kids on the block are there. But we are at the dawn of the greatest period of reality television ever. <laughs> because for the next decade or two, the millennials will all be rolling through their midlife crisis. If you thought they had realm of the four, oh my. <laughs> all right, here are the big four economies that we care about. Bottom left is the Germans. Very similar to the Korean story for very similar reasons. Very rapid industrialization, very rapid urbanization, very rapid drop off in the birth rate. This, like in Korea, is their last decade as well. If you want a beamer, buy it now. Get 10 years of parts, you're going to need those. <laughs> Top right, Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> 
they looked at globalization back in the 50s like, this feels a lot like an American security plan. We want nothing to do with this. So they didn't join the party until the wall fell. And they're like, oh, I guess this is the only game in town. Fine, let's do that. They started industrializing and urbanizing, but not until 1992. Since then, their birth rate has fallen just as everyone else has before. It's less than half of what it was 35 years ago. And if they keep aging at their current rate, they will be in a Korean-style crisis around 27. That's a lot of time to figure out another path. Oops. The news China. This is already one of the five fastest aging workforces in all of recorded history. And we now know that this data is wrong. This is data from last July. In July, the Chinese re released partial data from their 2020 census. Take a look at the very bottom. The Chinese are now reporting that in the last five years, they've experienced a sharper decline in their birth rate than what happened to the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. And this data is wrong. The Chinese Academy of Sciences, whose job it is to interpret this data, says that this still overcounts the Chinese population by more than 100 million people, with all of the missing millions of people who would have been born since the one-child policy was adopted 40 years ago, meaning that all of the missing millions are under age 40, suggesting that these yellow bars don't even exist. Now, we're well past the realm of the worst demographic decline in recorded human history, which would be the Black Death. And this is without a war, without a plague, without an agricultural problem. And there are now a number of Chinese demographers saying that even this is too optimistic, that there's another 200 million people missing, all in that lower section. This is not survivable. China will cease to exist as a unified, industrialized nation state within 10 years. And it's time to start preparing for that. It's actually so bad that it's time to start thinking about what a post-Han world means, because we will reach that before the end of this century. All right, what does this do to labor costs? Here are a number of countries in Southeast Asia that I think are actually going to do fairly well as globalization falls apart. Here are our Mexican neighbors and partners right in the middle, very competitive, and here are the Chinese. 15-fold increase in labor costs since the year 2000. Chinese labor productivity hasn't been trouble. They are no longer cost competitive in any manufacturing subsector. The only reason we still think of the Chinese as a major industrial power is because of the sunk cost of the industrial plant. Now that's $35 trillion. That is not Nothing. You do not move away from that overnight. But I have not had a conversation with a manufacturer in the last 36 months who has moved their system over nearshoring, reshoring, friendshoring, whatever you want to call it, where they haven't discovered a shorter supply chain with fewer steps, with fewer complications, and at a lower cost and higher quality. So the only question is the pace in which we can make an adjustment to a post China world. And the more we can front load, the better off we will be. Because it's either in an era of constrained labor and constrained capital, getting ahead of this, or waiting until it breaks and trying to do it in an environment where the Chinese are no longer providing goods. Every day that China does not collapse is a gift because it gives us a day to prepare for the Chinese collapse. And help the Chinese cope with that process. Take it where you can. All right, let's talk about the United States a little bit. Uh, these are racial breakdowns of demographics in some of the uh, <laughs> fun states that we're going to have in the electoral contest this year. The orange part in the middle, that's the gringos. The next band out, the blue, that's the Hispanics. So those are the two largest ethnic groups in the United States. The top left, you've got Texas, and the bottom left, you've got California. You notice how similar those are? In terms of age structure and racial structure, they are the two most similar demographics we have among the states. Anyone who tells you 
that race is anything more than a starting point to understand people's political loyalties is lying to you. Check this out. You see what this fault is? You also hear the stories about the millennials going out, winning their urban coastal experience. This is what it looks like. California took more of them than any other state. Now, there are a lot of stereotypes about millennials. A lot of them are very negative, lazy, narcissistic, show up for work at the crack of noon on a Tuesday for the first day of the week. The data supports that for half of them. The other half have always done everything we've demanded of them. They graduated from college not on time early. They didn't go off to Europe for five years to find themselves. They went straight into the workforce. Well, now that they're entering their 40s, the millennials, these two groups, are splitting. The negative millennials are staying as beach bums. The positive millennials are getting down to the business of having families, and that means moving out of California. Those are the ones that stayed. The Northeast, their bulge is right at retirement. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that you guys all realize that when people retire, they tend to get a little crotchety. <laughs> they tend to get a little bit more populist, a little bit more Trumpy. We've been thinking of the American Northeast as the bastion of liberalism. Not for a whole lot longer, because it's the most rapidly aging part of the country. And the red versus blue contest we've become so comfortable with is about to have a very different complexion. Bottom right, this is Florida. But compare it to Arizona. You know, this, this is what a state of old people looks like. This is not... Arizona has a reputation for being a retirement state. What it has is a lot of old white people. That's a very different thing. Arizona's problem isn't with the supply of labor. Arizona's problem is with bilingual training. Very different problem, much easier to solve. And so Arizona is the new tech center. All right, your neighborhood. Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. A few things to point out here. Number one, see this bulge of millennials? You don't have it. Your millennials are the ones that moved to the coast. The bad ones stayed on the coast. The good ones moved to Texas. We didn't come home. Obviously, that's a problem. It gives you more of a chimneyed demographic structure. That's not a disaster. Having equal supplies of skilled labor and unskilled skilled labor Capital consumers, capital producers. This is not a death sentence by any stretch of the imagination, but it's something unique to your region. Something else, however, that is a lot more common is this. The millennials did something that no generation had ever done before. Half of them, the bad millennials, went out and partied or found themselves and explored Europe for several years. So they were very late getting into the labor pool. The good millennials got screwed because when they entered the labor pool right away, they got in just in time for the subprime crisis to hit. And since they were the last ones who had been hired, they were the first ones to let go. Whether the millennials did the right thing or the wrong thing, they lost out on three to five years of formative work experience in their 20s, experience they will never get back. And that pushed back their ability to start families. They're doing the same thing that every other generation did with a six-year delay. And that shows up in the demographic stats almost every year. The problem you're going to be facing is for the next 20 years, the inflow into the labor market is going to be constrained. Last calendar year, the difference between the exiting boomers and the entering Zoomers was a shortage of 600,000 workers for that one year. And that number is going to increase each and every year for the next 12. After that, it will start to get better, but it's not going to be positive again until we get to the point that the millennials kids finally enter the market. That's 2045. Higher and borrow, higher and borrow, higher and borrow. <coughs> it's okay, it's not capital. This is the private credit curve for the United States. 
This is all funding from all non-government sources to all non-government sources. So it doesn't matter what you're trying to finance here. It's up here. Everything is up for the interbank rate for those who pay attention to that. Now, the bill from the start of this 2000, this bump in the middle, this seven and a half year period, that's the subprime bill. We doubled total private credit in seven and a half years. Too much, too fast. We had a bubble. When the bubble popped, it knocked 5% off of our headline GDP. Now, for those of you who are over age 35, you remember how much fun that was, right? It sucked. <laughs> Doubling of credit, 5% fallback. This is our baseline. Same data, different scale. Bump in the middle of double. Where's Canada? Any Canadians here today? Maybe you guys should be in charge of the border. <laughs> Maybe it's sneaking everywhere. Okay, from 2000 to 2007, while we were having our subprime build, I would argue that our Canadian neighbors had the healthiest banking sector in the world. They didn't even have a subprime category. They certainly didn't have something called asset-backed securities. And so when we had our crisis, they escaped it completely. But they had a very Canadian response to the Great Recession. Okay. Greatest recession ever? We can totally have a greater recession. <laughs> And they doubled down on every state that we had made. They invented the subprime category. They increased credit almost by a factor of four in the next five years. And then, in a fit of sanity, they took a deep breath and a step back. Like, oh, maybe we don't want to win this one. <laughs> and they dialed it back. They're still out of the woods. But I feel better about the financial sector up north now than I have at any time since 2013. I take my good news where I can these days. <clears throat> Germany. If you want to buy a house in Germany, you don't do what you do here. I mean, here, you get together your down payment of about 20%. You go into the bank, you ask for a loan to the other eight. In Germany, you go in and say, okay, open account today. Give us a deposit for what you think your monthly mortgage payment will be. Come back next month, do it again, and again, and again, and again. And you do that for 60 months. At that point, once you have proven that you are not a credit risk, we will entertain your loan request. There are many deep, structured, killing system, system killing problems in the German system today. Financial overextension is not on the list. That's more of a Reset. Sevenfold increase of credit in seven years. We know how that story went. They've already lost 55% off of the GDP. And then the COVID crisis hit and the numbers ceased to make any sense. Here is Australia. I love the Australian <coughs> like Oscar with character. <laughs> Australia and the United States have very similar governing, governing philosophies. We believe as federalists that most decisions that affect your everyday life, economic, political, cultural, should be made at the state and local level. And the national level is there kind of a safety net, if you will. Now, when it comes to finance issues, we are, of course, willing to make sane exceptions because if there's a financial crisis, you don't want any every individual governor having a different policy. That needs to be federalized. That needs to be at the top so that if there's a crisis, you can have a sharp adjustment in order to bail out everybody if it's necessary. So, for example, when we had the subprime crisis, three people, Sheila Baer of the FDIC, Paul Sen Treasury, and uh, Bernanke of the Fed, crowded around a two-top at a bar in D.C., and in less than an hour, worked out the rough details of what would soon to be known as the world as TARP. It was a restitution program that put a floor under the crisis and set the stage for real estate to heal and recover. The Australians did something very similar, but there was a big difference when it comes to social responsibility between the Aussies and the Americans. Us Yanks, we put a hook into it. So if you wanted to apply for the bailout funds and you had done something stupid, either as a lender or a lendee, you were then on the hook for at least some of the losses. It wasn't free money. In Australia, it was. You got 100% loan guarantee no matter what you had done. 
Moreover, if you could prove to the government that you could meet your mortgage payment moving forward with a 100% government guarantee, you automatically apply for, automatically qualify for a second loan, a second mortgage, and a third, and a fourth, all government guaranteed. The Australians have yet to begin their subprime adjustment. And when they do, you do not want to be down here. <laughs> India, same policy as the Australians, but to qualify for the funds, you had to be a friend of the Prime Minister. <laughs> here, here's China. <clears throat> as my Aunt Mary is famous for saying, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what we're intimidated by? This is Enron on a bad day. This is every economic subsector. Now, if you guys hear what's going on with their housing sector, the overbuild now because of this credit splurge is so much that the best guess by the Chinese Academy of Sciences is that there are spare units of sufficient number to put up somewhere between 1.5 and 3 billion people. That is more spare housing in one country than the rest of the world has combined times five. And that's not even the sector that's most affected. That would be agriculture. They use on average five times as much pesticides, herbicides, and the rest as the rest of the world does. So when this goes, and it will go, you don't get a subprime style collapse in every economic subsector at the same time. You don't simply have the evisceration of private savings from the housing collapse. You also have family. There are things about the Chinese system I worry about. Their survivability and their strength aren't on the list. Now, this is normally where if you had a competent government with their fingers in everything and they didn't have to worry about interest groups or pesky democracy things, that you could impose a series of decisions and take the long view and steer this down a different path. That is not the government China has. China has a cult of personality. Chairman Xi has gutted the entire system of everyone who's capable of conscious thought. He has spent the last 13 years purging local governments, regional governments, the national bureaucracy. He's working on the military now. He's already finished with academia and business. There's no one left who will tell him anything. He hasn't surrounded himself with yes men. This is not Donald Trump. He has surrounded himself with silent men. And no one will inform him of anything because they don't know how he's going to react. He has shot the messenger so many times that there's nothing left. The bureaucracy has taken a page, what they think is his playbook, to adjust their policies, to make sure that no information can be generated that might upset him. So, for example, when the COVID opening finally happened, they just stopped collecting deaths, death information. They just don't know. So for a good year period, we had no idea how many people had died in China from whatever. How many people did COVID kill? 1 million, 10 million, 20 million? We have no idea. We'll never know. The data doesn't exist. Things that kind of matter, like bond data, who buys bonds, who sells bonds, who's issuing bonds, that's not even collected anymore because it might clash with the credit story that the banks are telling. The ones that worry me more than others, college dissertations, and political biographies of people under 30. Because if you don't even collect that information, they have no way to get their fingers into the system and start to climb up. And that way, they can never challenge Xi personally. He's destroyed his current government, the generation makes his current government with silence. And he's destroyed the ability of the next generation to be the four. Couple You guys remember back to January of 2022 when the war started in Ukraine and Putin himself was making daily threats against foreign countries about nuking them if they didn't do this, that, or the other thing. The way it was explained to me when I was in Washington once was that the American ambassador to Russia was dispatched with a special message from the White House that went something like this. Mr. Putin, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. 
but I'm going to hopefully shine a light on it from a different enough angle that you'll adjust your behavior. So, Mr. Putin, do you remember how a month ago you were in that safe house below the Kremlin, the one that's an enclosure in an enclosure in an enclosure so that there could be no electronic monitoring, how you never allow phones or computers, so everyone has to take their notes manually. And that's the day, that's the meeting, when you decided the where and the when of the invasion. And you remember how less than an hour after that meeting broke that we released the full text minutes of that meeting to the international press. That was our way, subtly, as Americans, of telling you that we know exactly where you are at any given moment. So if you think for a second that you can fling a nuke into the Western Hemisphere, and that the first half dozen that we send back are going to go anywhere except directly up your ass, you're out of your mind. So stop it. And he did. Putin has many flaws, but he has an inner circle that he speaks with. Some of them he trusts. Some of them are even competent. But the point is there's conversations. So there's phones you can tap and email you can hack to get a view of what's going on inside the Kremlin. We are the world's best at that. G has no one at all. There are no conversations. It's just the voices in his head. Adoration from below, silence up above. He's become everything that Donald Trump ever dreamed of. And it's a horrible way to run a government. Because even if he is God's gift to management, one person cannot manage a system the size of China, especially if they have no idea what's going on. But I think the best example of is that stupid balloon. <laughs> now, when that thing floated in from Canada a few months ago, thanks for that, I had the same response as the American president. Clearly, this is a spy platform. It's 350 feet across. It's dangling an apparatus that is larger than an Embraer jet. You guys know Embraer's? Yeah, the really cramped ones. You've got like one seat on one side, two on the other, the bottom three jets. They're tiny, unless they're dangling from a balloon, in which case they have a little heft. Clearly, it's a spy platform. Shoot it down. Let's see what we've got. But I, like the American president, am not a balloon expert. But despite all of our flaws as a country, we don't have a problem with information transmission within government like the Chinese do. So in this specific issue, there was one guy in the sub-basement of the Pentagon all the way at the end of that hallway that needs asbestos remediation, up against the physical plant, the guy with the really bad comb over that no one wants to make eye contact with, he's a balloon expert. And his report made it up the chain all the way to the top. And so the Secretary of Defense and the CIA director had to sit down with the American president and said, Mr. President, please don't shoot this thing down. We are not worried about it. We know where it's going to go. It's going to float over our missile silos in North Dakota. But Mr. President, unless we misinterpreted what happened in the last few cabinet meetings, you don't sound like you're about to nuke someone. So Mr. President, it doesn't sound like we're going to launch. And if we're not going to launch, those hatches over those silos will be closed. Because they're always closed. The Chinese will get photos of closed hatches from seven miles away. This is not a big deal. This is not a problem. This is not a national security threat. But Mr. President, what it is, is a national security opportunity. Because if you let this thing go on its merry way and let us do our jobs, we will put a spy plane over it and a spy helicopter cover under it. And we will put every whisper sensor we can redirect on this thing. And we will track this son bitch for the next 10 days. We will get copies of all their cryptography. We will know which satellites they're bouncing command signals on. We will know how they're sending information through our civilian ground network. And a reminder, Mr. President, our national security agency has more offensive ha hacking capacity than the combined governments of the rest of the world. So in nine days' time, we will be able to tell you not what city, not what block, not what building, not what floor, not what office, what terminal is commanding this thing. And we will hack the tar out of that terminal and we will tag everyone who comes into contact with it and we will rip apart their intel collection system from the inside. Mr. President, this 
is the intelligence breakthrough of the decade. And they just handed it to us. And so Joe Biden says, yeah, 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 do that. <laughs> so we did. What the Chinese did with the balloon was the dumbest thing I've seen any country do in the last 20 years. And if you think back on the last two decades, we have not exactly had a shortage of dumb. <laughs> 10 years is how long the Chinese had if everything goes perfectly. They are perfectly capable of screwing this up on a much faster time frame. Okay. Oh, yeah. Whether this is good or disaster, of course, depends on who you are and care about. Here's somewhere we will all feel it. This is an inflation graphic from the American Enterprise Institute. The double yellow arrow in the middle, that is total inflation in the United States since the year 2000, or roughly 75% price increase. All the blue lines below it are things that in real inflation index terms have gotten cheaper, and everything above it with the red lines are things that have gotten more expensive. Oversimplifying, but as a rule, everything above it is something that requires fingers, eyes, skills, souls, being up there. Everything below it is something you plug into a wall, it has a button, and it beeps. A manufactured product. Americans are very good at the stuff above the line, the Chinese are good at the stuff below the line. In part because of subsidies, in part because of a large workforce. Everything that's below the line now has to be made by the people who are making things above the line. And we should expect the cost of manufactured goods overall to get significantly more expensive. The Chinese may have massively mismanaged their system, but it came at a benefit for us in terms of living costs. <coughs> that now goes away. So we have to talk about inflation. <coughs> this is the United States and Canada. Systems that are tightly intertwined, very similar. You can expect the data to track it does. Two big stories. First, where we are now, the far side. About 25% of the inflation we've had in the last couple of years is because of the retiring boomers. And that percentage, that impact, is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger for every year for at least the next 12. But that's not the whole story. Also, in the last two years, we've been dealing with COVID. Every time we had a new opening, or closing, a new vaccine, a new variant, hypochondriacs got control of policy, the anti-vaxxers threw a fit, whatever it happened to be, we changed how we consume. Well, if you go back about 27 months, Texas, Arizona, Florida, reopened for the last time. Over the next six months, Alberta, plus every other American state, state California, also reopened. And then finally, on the tail end of that, the rest of Canada and California gave it up. It takes 18 to 24 months for industrial supply chains to catch up to changes in demand. And that amount of time is pretty much past now. So we should expect inflation to continue to tick down, as it has for the last year and a half, as things finally get back to some version of normal, something we're more familiar with. That's the story of the now. To understand the story of the future, though, we need to look back a little further, because we've had three big inflation patterns in North America since World War II. First, we had that initial period of globalization and industrialization, where we built our cities, and we ran power to the countryside, and we ran the interstate highway system. We had 15 years of industrial, demand-driven inflation. And then the baby boomers were unleashed upon us all. And they raised their kids and they built their homes. And we had two decades of consumer demand-driven inflation. And then of late, we've been living in this weird-ass period. The Chinese entered the party with a billion industrial workers pushing the cost of manufactured goods down for everyone. And the Russian system, the Soviet system, dissolved, pouring an empire of raw materials upon the world, keeping commodity prices under control. 
for most of us, this is the sum total of our entire business lives. And from a historical point of view, it's the most atypical period in human history. And it's over. The Chinese labor is literally dying out. And the Russian materials, because of war, because of sanctions, because of lack of maintenance, is going away. But the consumption stories are bad. The boomers may be retiring, but the kids, the millennials, are at the peak of the consumption. They have another eight to 10 years to run with that. And if we still want stuff in a post-Chinese, post-German world, we're gonna to have to build it ourselves. We need to double the size of the industrial plant on the North American continent. We need to do it as quickly as possible. If you add all this up, all this demand, all this investment, all this lack of inputs in an environment of less capital and less labor, we're looking at nine to 15% inflation through at least 2030. Now, before you have a circle, call your broker, deep breath, double the size of the industrial plant. That means local workers building local products, taking local orders, using local infrastructure that has fewer supply chain steps, uses less energy, uses less water, that is cleaner, that is faster, that is higher quality, to serve customers who are closer to hand. And when we're done building those supply chains, we will have a system that is largely immune to international shocks. This isn't a good story. This is the story of the greatest economic growth in the history of Mexico and Canada and the United States. And it will generate record growth along the way. It's just, we have a lot of work to do and it's most definitely not a straight line. Okay, let's make this matter easy. <laughs> What matters on this map is the tan. That is the arable zone within the United States that is broadly suitable for crop. And the blue lines, which are the river system. The United States has roughly 3,000 miles of naturally navigable waterway. And anyone who has moved house knows, physically dragging stuff from point A to point B is a bit of a bitch. But if you float it, it's easy. Moving materials by water is one twelfth the cost of moving them by land transport, by truck. And the United States has more miles of naturally navigable water than the rest of the world's countries combined. This has always been our top superpower. It was always easy for us to trade among ourselves. And it has been the key to American success until a century ago, when we did the dumbest thing we possibly could. Every waterway in the world is covered with boats like these. Small haul container ships in bulk that move things from point to point. With one exception, one country doesn't do that, us. Why? We've made it illegal. Back in 1920, we passed something called the Jones Act, where we said that any cargo being shipped between any two American ports needs to be 100% American financed, owned, Built, captained, and crewed. Oh, it can't sail at all. And over the next five decades, the amount of cargo that we transported on our waterway network dropped by 99% and has never recovered. We don't apply this restriction to road, to rail, or to air, just to water. We're sitting here on the Ohio, which is the greatest navigable river in the world, and we have shut it down. Ohio is specifically the state in the union that has suffered the most from this policy. And the reason that 150,000 people don't live in this town is because of this policy. The reason we don't manufacture much is because of this policy. If I were part of the Ohio congressional delegation, I would be screaming about this every time I got to the Congress. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean you don't have transport options, but it does mean that you don't. Here's your rail map. You're, of course, right at the arrow. You'll notice that it's fairly dense because you've got population centers around you, but you've got this kind of gaping empty zone right here with one class one rail line cutting through. Now that class one rail line can handle about 5% of the cargo of what the Ohio River could be. So it's not nothing, but it's a little hollow. Doesn't mean you can't use it. 
but it can only take you so far. And it shapes what you can do, because in this region, it will always have a problem with scale. Anything you're going to do can't be small. I'm sorry, it can't be large, because the numbers aren't there. The transport orders are not there. If the Jones Act went away, I would say something very different. But for now, it's there. And that shapes the discussion, which means we need to go out abroad one more time to show how this kind of shapes where you are. This is <coughs> Russian space. Uh, this is a population density map on the right. And that lighter color of orange is roughly the population density of Nebraska. If you now scoop out Lincoln and Omaha. So yes, there are people there, but like it's a rounding area. On the left, you've got a combined economic and climate map. The green zone that roughly uh, the green zone which roughly overlaps populated Russia, that's the wheat belt. That's the part of Russia that's worth having. That's where you can actually grow food. You move out of that, it gets ugly real fast. If you go to the right, to the north, to the blue, tundra, tegai, empty, worthless. If you go to the left, to the south, to the yellow, desert, empty, worthless. But what drives the Russians to binge drink? That's the beige that's on the shoulders of the good man. Territory that even by Russian standards is worthless, but it's empty and it's flat, and you can totally shove a mongol board if you want. So what the Russians do, what the Russians have always done, is try to expand out of the green, through the beige, until they hit a series of geographic barriers that you can't run a panzer division through. And then forward position the troops on the access points between those barriers. Plug the access points, plug the gaps. If they can do that, they can shrink their exposed border from roughly 5,000 miles to 500. And that's a defensible position. Ukraine isn't the first post-Soviet war of the Russians trying to rebuild this outer perimeter. It's the ninth. It won't be the last because Ukraine doesn't control those gaps. It's merely on the way to the two more important ones in Poland and Romania. If there's anything that we understand about the Russians, it's that this is how they see the world, and they're broadly right. So when the Ukraine war started, we were gearing up for a direct military conflict with the Russians that we thought was going to be a pure fight on the plains of Poland. And when we saw that 40-mile-long convoy of military vehicles going from Belarus south to Kiev, a convoy that had more military firepower than the entirety of the pre-war Ukrainian military. We're like, wow. Thought it would be fast. Didn't think it would be this fast. And then something curious happened. On the fourth day of the war, the convoy stopped because they forgot the tool. And on the seventh day, soldiers started getting out of their equipment and walking back to Belarus because they also forgot food. And we realized that we were wrong. The Russians aren't set the greatest military in the world. In fact, they don't even have an army. They have a mob with guns. That's something very different. To this point in the war, the casualty ratio between the Ukrainians and the Russians are somewhere between a three and a seven man to one ratio favoring the Ukrainians. Against NATO, the actual combined forces military, it would probably be somewhere between 500 and 1,000. And there is no one in Washington or London or Berlin or the rest that is happy about that. Because if there's anything about the Russians that we understand, it's this is how they see the world. And if they finish with Ukraine to their satisfaction, they will come for Poland and Romania and the rest. And we will have that fight. And they will be obliterated on the conventional field of battle. But their strategic needs will have not changed. And they will fling nukes. So the decision was made in every NATO capital in the first month of the war. We have to stop them here, in Ukraine, now. We have to prevent that direct fight with NATO from ever happening in order to make sure that the nukes stay in their silos. To that end, in anything that the Ukrainians can prove that they can operate and maintain, very, very, very important word there, maintain. The Germans were very explicit on that point. A weapon system that you can only use once is not a weapon system. It's a paperweight. Operate and maintain. They can have. Everything else are details. There are a lot of details. 
But that was the commitment that the NATO countries made up front because it's cheaper than rebuilding cities. So we can fight this war with the Ukrainians in Ukraine, or we can rebuild Atlanta and Detroit. That's the choice. It's not a hard one. Now that has some consequences. And the war is evolving. In the last month, the Russians have started fielding defects. This is what's called a FAB 1500. It's a 1500 kilogram weapon. It's a dumb bomb that eventually makes a blast radius that is more than a third of a mile across. The problem that the Russians have always had is accuracy. The problem that we have already had is heavy blast capacity. We fight a continent, a hemisphere away from where we're from. So we have to be precise with our weapon systems. So we have better guidance and better intel. The Russians are fighting among a much shorter chain of support. So they go for the big bottom line. What they've done with the FAT 1500, a bomb that has two tons of explosive capacity, is in the last few weeks they've started fitting them with something called a glide kit. You guys remember back to Desert Storm? We started putting glide kits on our dumb bombs. They were only 500 pounds, it's tiny compared to these guys. But that's what allowed us to target bridges and buildings in Iraq with precision. The Russians don't have within an order of magnitude that kind of accuracy. These things only hit it in 50 to 100 feet. But when your blast radius is 2,000 feet across, that's plenty. We're seeing the Russians marry their sheer mailed fist approach to military ordnance to a degree of precision. And in the battle, for Avedivka, they drop about 300 of these things in a 48-hour period. That's what won them that battle. And we're seeing a fundamentally different Russian military emerge in just the last few weeks. Massive power, reasonable accuracy. We've never had to face that before. Now, for their part, the Ukrainians are also innovative with drones. The one at the bottom, this is the beaver, not a very intimidating name. And the one above it is the scythe, which is literally made out of plywood. This one has an, oper I'm sorry, an operational range of about 600 kilometers. This one, 400. This one carries about a 15 pound bomb. This one carries about a 70 pound bomb. This one is literally built in people's garages and then targeted by the Ukrainian military. And they're using these things to target refineries. They have found in the last two months the capacity to gut punch the Russian economy in a way that none of the sanctions have done so far. The Russian educational system collapsed in 1986. The youngest people in Russia who are worthy of the term in the near turned 64 this year. The ability to repair a fractionating column in a refinery is a limited skill set that the Russians no longer have. And the few people they know who are adjacent to that skill set are in Ukraine's part of the war effort or are building munitions. And so we're seeing more and more refineries come offline. But the best part is this guy up here. This is a Phoenix Ghost. This is an American made operation. Uh, it's man portable, it's modular. You put in a backpack with a 10 pound bomb, you hike into Russia as part of a special forces group, you go a thousand miles from the border, you identify a target, you hand launch it. Some of the more recent attacks we've seen in the last week are definitely Phoenix ghosts. And so we've seen lots of refineries go offline. All the oranges are where we've had a meaningful attack with operations going on. Not permanent. These things can be repaired, but not quickly and not by the Russians. So they're having to bring in third-party nationals. My guess is that most of those third-party nationals are Chinese, which means we're this far away from the Ukrainians specifically targeting Chinese workers to bust sanctions with American weapons. This war is about to get really delightfully real. Okay, so that's really bad from an energy processing point of view. There's also problems on the production side. Uh, this is Western Siberia, in case anyone is looking for a sign. <laughs> now, you want to produce in the permafrost. You guys, we're in Ohio, you guys know. You go far enough north and get into cold enough territory, you get into a zone where the ground never really thaws in the winter. And in the summer, the top layer will thaw and you'll get something like this, they're called thermokarst lakes. If you want to produce something in this zone, what you got to do is wait for it to freeze solid, which
15 or 20 years old once a year. Then you run a uh, berm out through hundreds, if not thousands of miles of empty territory. You run a piece of infrastructure down the middle of it, a pipe, a road, a rail line. And then while everything's frozen, you drill on a drilling pipe. Because you can't drill when it's melted. You can't drill through swamp. And then you produce. So these are the highest upfront costs for material development on the planet. Unfortunately for the Russians, it's a dynamic landscape. So if a fault opens up and everything drains, it drains to the side and you get a massive slip. Or maybe it drains down, in which case you get a sinkhole. Or maybe you have a very, very warm summer and some of the permafrost melts deeper. And then when it refreezes, when water freezes, it expands and you get a bubble in the land. These are all really bad for infrastructure. And remember, the Russian educational system collapsed a long time ago. The Russians have the highest maintenance costs in the world, and most of this work for the last 30 years hasn't been done by them. It's been done by Exxon and BP, and especially the Dutch and the Germans. And all that work stopped when the Ukraine war began. Could be sanctions, could be war damage, could be lack of maintenance. We need to prepare for a world where all of the materials coming out of Russia don't make it. All right, compare that to us. I like to call this the checkbook map, because every dot up there is someone who paid the power bill. Here are three concentrations of checkbooks. You've got the Austin San Antonio quarter down below where I used to live. You've got Midland Odessa in West Texas, and up top the cultural mecca that is Bismarck, North Dakota. But what are these? Meet America's shale fields. Meet America's oil shale fields. So much natural gas is bubbling up as a byproduct of these three oil plants that they have to flare the gas until such time as they can build out the infrastructure to capture it. Now, in the United States, we have the world's largest and most versatile natural gas gathering, distribution, and usage system. But we can't keep up with the pace of the oil shale dr 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 drillers in these three zones. And so until the infrastructure can be built out, you can see the flares from space. Now, this is not your soil. The Marcellus and the Utica are different. They're unique among the shales and that it's a natural gas play and people are after the gas and it's the liquids that are the byproduct. So if you're in Texas, if you're in North Dakota, you're after the oil and you sell the gas at a loss into the system just to get rid of it. Here, the natural gas is what they're after because they're trying to fuel the cities from Chicago to Boston to DC primarily driven by natural gas electricity. The liquids that come up as a byproduct, something called natural gas liquids, because the people in the oil sector are not as creative as you might think. You also know these things as propane and butane. They get dumped into the system for something else. Here's our shale well maps. You can see this is the, the wet part of the plane. We use it for chemicals. Now, this is a grossly overcomplicated graphic. Sales. If you're on this side, the gray bar, that's crude oil. You refine that into something called naphtha, and that goes on to make dozens, hundreds, thousands of daughter products that we use every day. Or you start with natural gas, you separate out those natural gas liquids, you crack it into something called ethylene, and then again, daughter products. Normally, you would only use natural gas-based ethylene to make a very narrow product suite. Things that you can only make with natural gas. Natural gas is hard to produce. It's hard to move. It's very hard to store. It's a gas. It disperses. That's why everyone prefers oil, because it's a liquid. It stays where you put it. But since we have so much of the stuff coming out of the Bakken and the Barnett and the Haynesville and the Permian, here... The price difference isn't the same as the rest of the world. Everywhere else it's five to one. Here it's two to one. And so we use natural gas to produce whatever we can. And we've retooled our entire chemical sector to take advantage of that. But here it's different. Here it's the angelics that are the near waste product. 
And so the United States as a whole has the cheapest natural gas in the world because of Texas, but it also has the cheapest ethane and butane and propane in the world because of you, which gives us the best price advantage for doing anything that involves chemicals or refining. Because we use a different feedstock. And if for whatever reason we had a problem with natural gas, we just switch back to naphtha. It would be easy. So we have become the largest producer of every product category for all of the inter <coughs> of all of the intermediate products. Everything that's in a box is one of those intermediate products. We are now the world's largest supplier of all of them. And that is the second stage of the shale revolution. And we are now at the beginning of the third stage, where we take those intermediate products and make them actually into the finished goods that we use every day. Diapers, flooring, glues, chewing gum, condoms, plastics, everything. And that is a lot of opportunity for a lot of places. There we go. Oh, we also use a lot of natural gas for electricity. No shock there. The big thick line, that is the American average price. The green line up top is California, a state where electricity consumption is hardly encouraged, but electricity production is borderline illegal. <laughs> and then the three lines down below, that is West Virginia, Ohio, and Texas. You can see that you guys track because you're all in shale fields. You're all local. You all look at the energy production, you all have relatively low electricity costs versus the national average, which means you're well below everyone else. We laugh at California for their high power prices. Their power prices are about half of what they are in Europe. The competitive advantage here is massive. As for natural gas, uh, the lines to pay attention to here are the pink ones and the purple ones. Those are three of the largest natural gas transport lines on the planet. Each of them have about 10 BCF. That's a billion cubic feet per day. Each of those pipes is roughly equivalent to 8% of the total American production. So they are three of the five biggest lines we have here at all. And all of them with, are within, all of them are within arm's reach of everyone who lives in this zone. So let's talk recommendations. Number one, steel. The process of producing steel varies from place to place, but basically you take your iron ore, you put it into a big smelter with some coal, you cook the crap out of it to get carbon into it to increase its strength, and you get something called pig iron, which is useless except for further processing. You can either add more heat and make relatively low-grade steel that you would use in, say, an automobile frame or an I-beam for construction, rebar on roads, or you can process it at a lower temperature for a longer period of time and make high-end steel that can be used in surgical implements and cladding, and roofs, any place where you can see, any place that's corrosion resistant. Now, there's a lot of differences in these product categories. Here are the important takeaways. Over half of globally traded pig iron comes from Russia and Ukraine. That's a problem, because without pig iron, you can't make the high-end stuff at all. This, we have a cheat for. Structural steel can be recycled endlessly, forever. And the United States basically has something called an electric arc furnace system, where you run power through a bunch of steel, and you melt it down just from the power of the electricity. We do more of that than the rest of the world combined. That's 70% of our global steel production, 70% of our domestic steel production. And if we're going into a world where we need to double the size of the industrial plant here, we need every scrap of that we can possibly get. So recommendation one, build a power plant and some mini mills. You're looking for low hanging fruit, this is it. If all we do is double the size of the industrial plant, that's all we do, we need 50% more electricity than we have now and twice as much steel as we have now. You wanna throw the green transition into that, increase that to 100% increase. So whether you're a greenie or not, an economic globalist or a nationalist, we need more of both of these. This should not be controversial at all. And you guys have everything you need to start on both of them because the staff required to man either of these facilities is about 50. You don't need to be in a major metro in order to take advantage of this. You just need the natural gas. All right, let's talk manufacturing. If you 
the bottom of this, your supply chain is really simple. You can fit it on the back of a cocktail napkin, even after throwing that to move. If you're at the top, you don't know who your fourth, fourth tier supplier is. You certainly don't know who your 14th supplier is. If you're on the left, your system is mainland China. If you're on the right, you're dependent on NAFTA already. All right? Energy's easy. American production, American financing, American midstream, American workers, American processing, and for the most part, American consumption. This is the opposite of easy. The average iPhone has 1,400 manufacturing supply chain steps. They have been working very hard for the last four years to diversify away from China. And in those four years, they've gone from 91% exposure to 90% exposure. If you're an Apple guy, buy two, because when this breaks, we're not going to have a new model for several years. They'll have to rebuild elsewhere. That'll take probably five years. Anybody else? Okay. First up, automotive. Ohio is a top 10 automotive state. Courtesy of NAFTA 2, 80% of the vehicles that are produced in the United States already have supply chains that are 80% within NAFTA. As we nationalize, as we move away from China, that will come closer to 90%. That 10% increase is a trillion dollar question. There's plenty of room to expand in that area. The problem is, is that there's a definite network effect when it comes to auto manufacturing. You really do need to be with about 30 miles of the pre-existing infrastructure. And you guys aren't. So I'm not suggesting that there's no win here, but it's not something that you should be like, you know, set your sights on. These are the things that matter more than anything else. If we don't get these right, we can't try the rest of it. Now, chemicals, courtesy of the Shell Revolution, we're already there. No one else is in the world, just us. So that's a space we absolutely can control, and we can now move into secondary and tertiary manufacturing. The big move that Ohio as a whole has been making because of the Marcellus Shell and all those liquids is they've been moving into higher tier plastics manufacture. And since there are thousands of plastics products, it is very easy to have a mini processing center anywhere in the area that has access to those liquids to build one or more of those products. In Ohio, in the major cities, this is already the major system. This is the secondary chemical processing area for the entire country. There is no reason you can't grab several pieces of this for yourself. Machinery, think of it as the stuff that builds other machines, especially other manufactured goods. The world leader is Germany. Luckily, the folks in second place are in Houston. So whenever I see someone from Houston at a presentation that is not in Houston, I'm like, get out of here, go home, build more machinery, like yesterday. Because if you don't get that right, the rest of us can't try. Materials processing. That's an ugly one, very energy intensive, doesn't matter whether it's steel, aluminum, lithium, silicon, whatever else. Very power intensive. Build power plants, build lots of power plants. And then finally, electrical steel. We're gonna need 50% more electricity. That means we need to expand our volume of electrical steel considerably. Here's the problem. We normally only make a lot of electrical steel at the time when we're electrifying for the first time. For us, that was in the 50s and early 60s. Since then, we've just let it scale down. We only build enough for our utility systems and some products like electrical goods. If we're going to expand the grid by half, we need to expand the electrical steel that we produce by a factor of 30. You can't do that here. The stuff that does electrical steel is built into the rolling process. That happens at the original point of creation in foundries, the big ones. This is an Indiana problem. And if they do not perform, you have the rights to target every Hoosier you see. <laughs> All right, semiconductors. Oversimplification to our three general categories. For starters, you've got your chips that are 90 nanometers and bigger. These are your dumb chips. These are your near analog chips. This is your Internet of Things. Then you've got 90 nanometers to 10 nanometers. This is the bulk of what we use. This is aerospace, automotive, most cell phones, most computers. Then you've got your 10 nanometer and better, the good stuff. This is your iPhone. 
This is the logic chip in your laptop. This is electric vehicles. This is artificial intelligence. Now, the stuff at the bottom, that's not hard, but 80% of it comes from China. And so if you want a smart margarita machine, now's the time. We can rebuild that. It's easy, but they'll take money and time that we might want to spend on other things. The stuff at the top, very specialized. 90% of those chips come from one town in Taiwan. And it's so much worse than that sounds. Because the coalition of companies that allow those Taiwanese fabrication facilities to function, there's 9,000 of them. Everyone is necessary, and half of those companies only make one product for one end user, and they face no international competition at all. It is globalized specialization in physical form. And if you lose any of those 4,500 companies, you can't make the high-end chips at all. And so the ecosystem is rebuilt somewhere else. That'll take several years. So all these arguments and debates and these fear conversations we're having about the implications of artificial intelligence, I'm actually proud of this because we're having these conversations before the technology hits us. But I think we have a few more years to figure out the details because we're not going to be able to make enough chips to make it happen. The stuff in the middle, 10 to 90. I don't worry about that. There are 11 different countries that finish chips in that category. Israel, Ireland, us, Canada, Germany, Italy, Korea, China, Japan. It's a robust system with a lot of competition in the supply chain. So you can peel out entire continents and we can still produce those at scale. So from a tech point of view, the world we're in today looks fairly durable. We're probably not going to advance very much for the next few years. And we're probably not going to digitize the stuff that we really don't need to digitize. I mean, do we really need a flashing shower pan? We'll get by. What's going on in Columbus right now is an attempt to take that top category and produce it at scale within the United States. If everything goes perfectly, the first batch of chips will probably come out in late 2026. And we will know by the end of 2027 whether Intel has mastered the new technologies enough for us to have that AI conversation again. But that is the soonest we will get our first indication of whether it's going to work. Best guess, they're going to be a couple years behind. That's reasonable considering the scale of the technological shift we're trying to make. But that means we really have until 2030 before we need to worry about this. But if any of it works, even if they only make four nanometer chips, that's the whole thing. When you make a semiconductor, you take a seed crystal, you put it in a vat of liquid silicon, and you pull it up until it makes a crystal about the size of a Volkswagen. And you take a thin strip horizontally to make a disc, you etch it, you dope it, you bake it, and then you repeat that process upwards of 100 times. It takes nine months. Then you get finished processors on this big disk. You break them into individual chips, and now you have little pieces of fancy silicon that are really expensive, that are utterly useless by themselves. It takes somebody with fingers and eyes to take those individual pieces and build them into a motherboard, or a computer chip, or a processing unit, or a control system. <coughs> And that all has to be done by people. And that's the perfect job for this region. <clears throat> this area has a much higher skill set for technical work within its labor force than the national average. And there are thousands of these things that will have to be done every minute, all being sourced from Columbus. You want to look for low hanging fruit? You do the wiring assemblies that incorporates things into intermediate products that can form the products that we use every day. Electronics is the only place of this where I really get to worry. The reason that electronics is dominated by the East Asians is because they have a differentiated labor market. So the person who does the die cast is not the person who does the plastic shaping, is not the person who grinds the lenses, is not the person who does the wiring, is not the person who programs the motherboard. Those are all different labor price points at different skill sets. And in East Asia, there's 13 different quality levels across the continent. We have two. We have Anglo-America and Mexico, and that's it. 
So if we just picked up that manufacturing model from East Asia and drop it here, we're going to run out of people really fast, and the cost of products are going to be something we're not willing to pay. But there's hope because of what's happened with apparel. You guys remember back, well, some of you are way too young to remember back. If you go back to the 1980s, our manufacturing model for textiles was very simple. Appalachian women with sewing machines. And then NAFTA happened, and it became Mexican women with sewing machines. And then the World Trade Organization happened again, Indian, Chinese, and Bangladeshi women with sewing machines. It followed the price point of labor, and that was it. That was the sole determinant. And then COVID happened. And everyone shut down at the same time. And we had no clothes. And we are not Swedish. Going naked was never an option. So some enterprising folks in Mississippi and North Carolina came up with a new model. These giant facilities that were two acres under one roof, they could bring in raw cotton, clean it, turn it into thread, yarn, cloth, cut it into clothes, stitch together, even do some finishing work. Facilities for the staff of two. A software engineer, a mechanic. And the products that would come out of the backside of that plant would have a lower cost per garment than what was coming out of Bangladesh. The model had changed, and we didn't realize that until we had to find a way. We're going to find things like this, but we're not going to find them until we start looking. And one of the reasons I'm relatively optimistic about this, even in the electronic sector, is again, the wiring. Everything in the world that runs on electricity requires a wiring harness. And everything that uses a computer chip requires a control chip and a control system that has a wiring harness. It is the common denominator in everything that uses electricity. And the best thing about these facilities they can have a staff of 50 to 100, and anything that they make, they can retool for and make something else within a week. It's value added, it's high paying jobs, it's technical skills, and it integrates into other people's supply chains who can do it at scale. Win, win, win. All right, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. If you're looking for more, the QR code on the left goes to the video log. It is free. It will always be free. I will never share your data with anyone. But if you come across something, you're like, oh, yeah, I would totally pay for that. Uh, kick some money, not to me. Well, I mean, I'll take it. But, you know, send it to the QR code on the right. Uh, that is MedShare. They're a medical charity that I'm supporting right now. They provide medical assistance to communities who, through no fault of their own, have lost the ability to look after themselves. So, for example, should the Russians bomb your power grid, they step in to help hospitals with generators, with fuel, and certain things. And this link goes directly to their new parenting page. Okay, I'm sure that was way over my time. I apologize. There was a lot to get through. Uh, I am here for Q&A, and my flight is in until 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. So, you know, <laughs> ask for it. Go ahead. So, with the, uh, going back to the beginning of your lecture, with the demographics of the workforce aging, is this migration to the southern border helpful to us in the future because most of those younger coming in unskilled at this point can be trained up to skilled labor force. Does that change that flare that Potentially. Um, the problem with making that prediction is there's a few political questions you, we have to ask first about, you know, how sustainable are these flows, whether we're going to change our approach towards immigration regulation. We haven't had meaningful changes to the regulatory structure for this since 1986. And it's woefully in need of an update. Um, but looking at just the numbers, 2 million people crossing in from the southern border, that's actually a lower number than we've had for net migration into the country on average for the last 60 years. Um, one of the many things that Trump did that I was not a fan of is he basically closed down all legal approaches to immigration. And one of the things that Biden has done that I am not a fan of is he has maintained Trump's policy and made sure it will outlast him. So we have a bipartisan agreement that no one should come legally, which means if anyone's going to come, they have to come illegally, which is, of course, a problem in another way. Uh, right now, the illegal population in the country is roughly, we keep changing the number, let me put that a different way. 
the amount of the workforce that is illegal is about four to six percent of the total. So if we do what Biden is hinting at and what Trump has flat out threatened, we're going to take a big bite out of the workforce. Oh, my God, please not now. From an economic point of view, that would be disastrous. You think we're having inflation issues now? You take that kind of bite out? Oh, oh, oh. that'd be awful. Uh, but we absolutely need a better way of regulating this. So if I were king for a day, I would take a page from 1978. Because in that year, a pair of hurricanes hit Honduras and Nicaragua, and 500,000 people lost their homes and their means of living overnight. And so their choices were to stay in the mud where they were and starve to death or start walking north. The Carter administration sent some immigration officials down and just handed out three-year worker permits to anyone who wanted one. They would come here and they were told, thank you, that if you kept your nose clean, if you pay your taxes, you report it into your immigration officer, after three years, you can do one of three things. Number one, for a fee, you could apply for a one-year extension. Number two, you could go home. We will pay for your flight home. Or number three, you could start the path to citizenship. It gave the would-be illegals a reason to cooperate with our law enforcement, financial, and legal systems. And so they were all in the network from day one. Some version of that at the border, I think, is a great idea. The boomers are retiring. The replacement, the Zoomers are insufficiently numerous. And let's be honest, most Zoomers don't want to go outside. They don't like people. It's like <laughs> Zoom is a stretch. <laughs> But Guatemalans are like, bring it on. Uh, so they fill a hole in our labor force that we desperately need to. This would be, considering the nature of the international environment, a great time to refab our immigration system to attract the labor that suddenly doesn't have a home. Uh, I think that's too much to hope for. But if we can normalize the border, that's a great step in the right direction. We just have to culturally figure out how we want to manage this. And of course, that's a political question. Go ahead. In your book, you talk about uh, acting in the U.S. being with the rest of the world, that if they would join our side in the Cold War, we would provide free transportation, I'm not free, but safe transportation around the world. Now, you, I thought you predicted that it's not going to be that way anymore, the Navy's getting smaller. But, um, you know, we're still doing that in Yemen, where those pirates in Africa, China Sea. Our neighbors keeping it safe forever. The United States right now is holding the line, but it's getting incredibly stressed in doing that. But one of the transitions we've made in the last 35 years is we've gone from a small ship of frigate, I'm sorry, small ship navy of a lot of frigates and a lot of destroyers to 12 supercarrier battle groups and 10 marine expeditionary units with basically small carriers. And all of our small ships that are left uh, are basically dedicated to providing rings of escorts around those larger ships. Uh, in the 80s, when the last time there was a pressure, we had hundreds of destroyers, and there were no regional navies with the exception of the Soviets, and it, that was not a great one. Today, there are, much more regional, there are many more regional players, and we've made this transition to a very heavy fleet with a small number of vessels. What we're discovering in the case of the Red Sea is we are stressing our Navy to the max to block the missile attacks from what I consider to be the least competent terrorists in the world, operating from the least valuable territory on the planet. And we can barely block those. If a real country decided it wanted to do something, I doubt there's anything. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have anything to bring to the party. Remember, the National Security Agency is really good at hacking. They've been hacking the transponders of the Russian and Chinese ships that are in the Red Sea. And so the Houthis have started hitting them up because they think they're targeting Israeli ships. And it's a riot. But that is not a global naval management strategy. That's just a patch. It's a hilarious patch, but it's not enough to protect global sea lanes. So we're, we're nearing a point where whether it's because of policy or lack of military firepower, we're just not able to maintain uh, cover for both powers. Up top. Yeah. 
Um, we're seeing small colleges across the country close, probably because of demographics and uh, shift towards maybe manufacturing and blue collar jobs. Sure. If you were president of Merritt College, what would you do huh. in the next decade to make sure you not only survive but thrive? That's a loaded question. So <laughs> let me start by saying that the future of small liberal arts colleges is not bright at all. We're looking at fewer and fewer students for at least the next 20 years. We know that because they've already been born. And if we need to double the size of the industrial plant, the growth in the job market is in white collar and blue collar. That said, Marietta College is not a liberal arts institution. It's a professional training program. You just like the old name. Uh, you guys, I would argue with what I have learned while I was studying for this presentation and what I've learned today is that you're already on the path of basically matching curriculum to the skills needs of the region. You've always had an energy program. You've always had a business administration program. These things are not going to suck. Not a great time to be in our history. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My God, is someone here in our history major? <laughs> All right. Next. What would be about the Middle East? Briefly, the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> is there hope for who? <laughs> Israel had to act. There was a 9-11 style attack on them from Gaza, right next door. They had to act. And there was no way they could act in a way that would destroy Hamas that would not also wreck Gaza. And they don't care. And so that's what they're doing. But it is forcing a reassessment in the United States. The primary reason the United States has been involved in the Middle East for the last 70 years is not for oil for us, it's oil for the Alliance. We provide the global sea lane security so that oil can flow to Japan and Europe and the rest. Remember, in the late Cold War, starting in roughly 1980, China was a Cold War ally. So that includes flows to China. But 35 years on, our interest in globalization has fallen considerably. The Europeans have developed some alternative supplies in places like the North Sea and North Africa. They're getting stuff in the shale industry. We're now self-sufficient and a significant net exporter. And most of the crude that comes out of the Persian Gulf goes to China. So maintaining an involvement, maintaining a military footprint in the region in order to defend Israeli actions and to protect the Chinese economy, that's kind of a stretch now. More recently, the activity in the Red Sea is to protect Russian crude going into China. That's a stretch, too. So one of the things we've seen with the American reactions to what's going on in Israel and Gaza is we're starting to reassess what it is we want, which is a long overdue conversation that we should have started back in 1992 with George Herbert Walker Bush. We decided we didn't want to have that conversation then. We're being forced to have it now. I don't know where this is going to go. What I can tell you is this floating dock that the Biden administration is building outside of Gaza is the single biggest piece of infrastructure that Gaza has ever seen. And it's infuriating the Israelis. And the Israelis under Netanyahu seem to be agitating for at least a public breach with the United States. And if the United States comes to the conclusion that this is a headache we don't need, and by this I don't mean Israel, I mean the whole region, we are perfectly capable of leaving because us doing that would damage all of our global competitors. We're going to find out probably later this year how it's going to be. So if I was a betting man, I would suggest that we're looking at a longer-term partnership between the United States and Turkey, and then stepping back from the rest of it. Turkey is pseudo-democratic. They're a self-sustaining economy. they got a... Manufacturing sector that's kind of structured like Mexico is very productive. And more importantly, they're capable of taking care of themselves. They don't need arms transfers. They don't need concessionary loans. And they're a bulwark against a lot of other regional power centers that we have long had concern with, like Iran and Russia being at the top of that list. Comes at a cost. It's an ugly conversation. It'd be an uglier divorce. But if, if, if this is the path we ultimately choose, the future of the region will be Iran on one side, 
And then an alliance of Israel and a bunch of Arab states on the other. It's a fair fight. And Turkey will be the determiner of who ultimately wins. Of course, that means we lose the ability to tell anyone there what to do because we're not present. That's where we are. Go ahead. How do you see the situation in Ukraine and Russia? Oh my God, everyone who thought they knew how this war was going to go, myself included, was proven wrong. And so we were all reassessed and we were all proven wrong again. I'm just trying to keep up with where we are right now. Uh, the Ukrainians have clearly hit on a paramilitary strategy that ex exacts an incredible toll on the Russian economy and may prove to be determinative. But the Russians have very clearly struck upon a military strategy that is winning them space on the battlefield. It's still a fair fight. What we do matters. I don't know what we're going to do because Congress can't function. Uh, the soonest we might get a functional Congress is January, but that means you have to be able to predict how this election is going to go. And uh, the down ballot stuff, I really don't know. Sorry. Oh, God, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Three things are going on with the Republican Party. Number one, the reason the Republicans have tended to win at the national level is because their coalition is more coherent. So the pro-lifers don't care about military policy. Military voters don't care about business policy. Business voters don't care about social policy. They all have their own little stovepipes. They don't care about the details of anybody else's stovepipe. They all show up to vote. They might not like each other, but they don't hate one another. So it's a reliable coalition, whereas the Democrats is a rat's nest. And the Greens and the unions disagree on what economic policy should be. The gays and the blacks don't even agree on what the term civil rights means. Any candidate who tries to run on the issues can get the sparks of civil war. Not everybody shows up, they tend to lose. What Donald Trump has done is he's introduced democratic style organization into the Republican coalition and he's broken it. So at least one third of Republican registered voters aren't even going to show up. That's enough for a catastrophic historical loss right there. That's just one. Number two, independence. The Republicans have never won a national election unless they won at least two thirds of the independent vote. And we're a center right country. That is usually not been hard until Trump. Everyone seems to have forgotten what happened with the midterms. In all the races that mattered, independents voted for the Democrats four to one. Why? Donald Trump told them that the general election doesn't matter. All that matters is the primaries, because that's where he dominates. Independents only matter in the general election. So they basically got together and said, hold them here. <laughs> We have only had one midterm election in American history where the ruling power hasn't been decimated in Congress. And that was during Reconstruction, special case. The independents aren't the Republicans anymore. Third, two weeks ago, the Republican Party died. Trump finished his takeover of the Republican National Committee, put his daughter in law in charge, and the first thing she did was fire anyone at the institution that dealt with candidate selection media messaging, research, and polling. It destroyed the ability of the national party to function as a national party. Those first two factors, the civil war among the Republicans, the independents changing sides, that guarantees that Trump will lead the Republicans into the second or third worst national outcomes of any party in American history. At most Republicans will carry 12 states, none of them large. That third thing, the gutting of the RNC, that threatens to take it down by it. How far? You don't know. Days are young. The nominations haven't happened yet. But they destroyed the ability of the party to shape the message. And the message that is coming out is not just antithetical to Democrats and independents, but business and national security law and order republic. So this is going to be a wipeout. The question is, how far down does it go? Now, this is this is not abnormal for the United States. Every generation or two, our parties 
adjust. They evolve all the factions that make them up, move them around. The last time we went through this, we had the Great Depression, we had World War II, African Americans were all Democrats, I'm sorry, African Americans were all Republicans, big business were all Democrats, but we had changes in technology and demographics and trade trends. And everything moved around into a format that would made more sense for the era we're in. We're going through that now. You think about what's gone down in the last 30 years. We've had the rise of the boomers, now the retirement. We've had hyper-globalization, now it's collapsed. We've had the information revolution, now we have social media. Of course, we're going to do things different. But it's awkward, and it's painful, and it's uncomfortable. And it takes 6 to 12 years, and we're only halfway through this process. But we will get through it. We just might not like, personally, what the parties look like on the other side. And this is just the Republican side. The Democratic side is an absolute shit show as well. But at the moment, they're less of a shit show than the Republicans. So they have this election in the bag so long as Biden doesn't die. He can drool. He can trip. He can be in a coma. He just can't die. If he dies, I reserve my right to change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You spoke very highly, I, at least my senses, of George H.W. Bush. Sure. In 1992, if H.W. Bush wins that election, that will go home. How is the world going? Oh, you want to go share on this? <laughs> Clear back time? Yeah. <laughs> it's a return on Yeah. Uh, Herbert Walker Bush had his failings. One of them was he felt the need to consult with the people. His whole election pro program was that all of America's leaders, political, economic, and cultural, should have basically a conflict to hash this out. So the answer to your question is what would we come up with in the early 90s had we been forced to have that conversation? <coughs> I would guess, from the way he would have tried to steer the conversation, is the first thing he would have done is go to the countries that we have the tightest economic and cultural links to, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand, five eyes, and come up with a common position. And then the five of us would get together with the allies who are demographically stable, militarily capable of looking out for themselves, and economically secure, Japan, France, Mexico, and in that second round, hammered out a rough plan. And for step three, present it to the world, take it or leave it. It's a good idea, but I want to share. I read recently that either the Ukrainians have either struck the first trade treaty again, or the Russians have just outright stopped using it. Like since we sat down here? Oh, okay. <laughs> when that <laughs> How do you think, if anything, this influences the course of the conflict over the next six months? If Kerch is brought down to the point that cargo cannot pass it, remember the rail line is largely offline still, it's just the road now, but if that is damaged enough that can't be used, then the Russians are incapable of bringing supplies and men and reinforcements into Canada or Ukraine at all. And the southwestern part of the front all of a sudden becomes a no man land for the Russian army, where all they have then is the east. So you would see a catastrophic military defeat of the Russians because the Russians couldn't retreat from Crimea and they can't get resupplied because the Russian, I'm sorry, the Ukrainian drones are sufficient to prevent the landing ships, the handful that haven't been sunk already, from reaching the Crimea in the first place. Uh, it wouldn't end the war but it would spell the end of occupation of half of the territories in question. And the PR hit that within Russia, from that sort of catastrophic loss might, 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 might be enough to damage government credibility to the point that things move on the political front. It wouldn't stop Putin from prosecuting the war. If somebody off Putin, it wouldn't stop his replacement from prosecuting the war. But that is the sort of defeat that in the past has triggered an uprising against Moscow. Something to consider. No guarantees, especially in war, especially in politics of freedom of Russia. Uh, but that has been some version of what the Ukrainians have been pushing for for about a year and a half. Uh, when I looked at the news this morning, I did not indicate that they had achieved that, but fog of war, I was looking at a thousand other things too, I might have missed it. I 
but I will look when I get done. Thank you, Lee. Sure. Sure. Any new thoughts or information about who took out the North Stream pipeline? The Scandinavians seem fairly convinced that it was the Russians, but they're not willing to say so out loud because the mainland Europeans are unwilling to do the next steps related to that happen, which would be to completely sanction all uh, flows of everything from Russia to European space. They're not ready for that yet. He's not yet. Um, I don't personally know who did it. Uh, the theory that it was the Russians doesn't make sense because then you trigger force majeure contracts and the Russians then have to pay the Germans at market prices for whatever natural gas they from other sources. It doesn't make sense that the Americans would do it because in the week, or sorry, two weeks before the pipeline was bombed, the Russians shut it off and told the Germans publicly, you have a single choice to make here. Either we turn this back on and you backstab Ukraine and pull out of NATO and see Ukraine our way, or we leave it off and you do industrialize. You choose. And the Germans chose to develop a spine. And Americans were in the back, like grabbing a hammer, because we were pretty sure that the Germans were making the wrong decision because they had made the wrong decision every time they lost their years. So we had gotten everything that we wanted. My guess, and it's just a guess, but it holds together most of most of the ideas, is that uh, Gazprom, the Russian energy company, did, that they sent a bomb through their own pipe because if it blows up and no one knows who did it, then they're not going to have to contracts anymore. Well, my theory falls apart in like 60 seconds of consideration. But that's better than the other piece. <laughs> Peter, you've been very generous with your time here. Oh, so. I'm all happy. <laughs> I'd like to thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a tradition at the Economic Roundtable that we uh, provide our speakers with uh, an official ERG jacket at the Economic Roundtable. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, is there a book signing going on? Oh, is there? Yes. We have, I, we have a couple books available, uh, available for purchase and donation to the project. Very good. So thank you all for coming and stop by if you'd like to get it.